It's how we celebrate that first Christmas usually, that silent night, holy night. It's a great celebration time. Angels and shepherds, songs, and worship. Luke records the story for us in Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. We sing songs about a silent night, a holy night. Sing songs about um, the, the, uh, the miraculous birth that took place. And, and we celebrate many times Christmas with that kind of feeling like everything is supposed to just kind of come to rest. And it's supposed to be peaceful and joy-filled. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a number of years ago, wrote a poem simply called I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, and shortly after he wrote it, it was um, set to music as well. Maybe you know uh, the words to these songs. You probably know the melody as well if you do. Just sing along with me this first verse, would you? I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And wild and sweet the words repeat a peace on earth, good will to men. And the second verse is, we don't sing it very often, but it kind of picks up the same joyful uh, tune there. I thought as how the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. Peace and goodwill is the focus of this song. It's the focus of a lot of people at Christmas time. But if you're like me, maybe sometimes you wonder a little bit if maybe when it comes to Christmas time, maybe we're just faking it just a little bit. I mean, if we're talking about peace, um, look around at current events. Aleppo, ISIS, assassinations, terrorism, wars, rumors of wars all around the planet. Can we really say peace on earth? And what about goodwill? Sometimes it seems like there's more ill will than there is goodwill. I, I know the stories of, of many people this year that have gone through divorces and heartbreak and illness and financial setbacks and and we're supposed to all of a sudden at this time of year switch gears and go, hey, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And sometimes I almost feel like, well, maybe, maybe we're faking it. Maybe we're just putting on this false front and saying that there's peace and goodwill at this time of year. And we're just saying, well, if I could just get through this, but boy, then I know what's coming on the other side. You know, Jesus even said that in John's gospel. He said, told us, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. And in Wadsworth, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, when he gets to the third verse, there is a dramatic change in the feel of his message. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Well, sounds great. And they're singing about peace and goodwill to men. But look at what he sings in the third verse. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong. And mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Do you feel like that sometimes? That the songs that you're singing are really just mocking this message of peace and goodwill? I, I think that perhaps when Longfellow got to this verse as he was penning his poem, that maybe he had in mind a little bit of the Christmas story from John. Now, some of you might have just kind of paused there for a second and go, wait a minute, I, you know, I've, I've read the Bible before. I know about 
I know about the, the Bible story in Luke. We just read that about Jesus' birth. And I know a little bit about the one in Matthew. But John doesn't really talk about that. Well, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about John's gospel. I'm talking about another book that John wrote, the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. John got a little glimpse of some behind-the-scenes activity in the spiritual realm surrounding that first Christmas. Listen to what he wrote. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Listen to who he makes war against. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Kind of a different story than what we're usually talk, singing about, the silent night, the holy night this war that's taking place in the heavenly realm. Satan did not want Emmanuel, God with us, to be born. He knew what that would signal for him if it took place. Betsy read a, that crippled lamb story was from Max Lucado. Max uh, wrote another book um, that he said that he wrote it after reading this account in Revelation that I just read for you. He's it's called an angel story, and he tells the story from the perspective of the angel Gabriel. Gabriel was the, the one sent to tell Mary, you found favor with God, and you are going to be the mother of Jesus. But just like we see in Revelation, all of this warfare that, that in the spiritual realm that took place outside of the, the, our, our eyes being able to see it, and so Max Lucado imagined what it might be like. And so he said at the beginning of the book, and I just want to read one section to you, but he said, I want you to give me a little literary license. We know that Gabriel was around, and so I'm going to tell it from his perspective. But he said, I'm going to make up the names of a couple of other angels. We know that there was more. We just read it in Luke that there was a whole bunch. So there's going to be a couple angels that you're going to hear here. Aegis is one of them, Paragon, and Sophio. You're going to hear those angels around here. The story where we're going to pick up, Mary and Joseph are on their way to Bethlehem. They just stopped for a little rest, got something to eat and something to drink. And Joseph found an ox cart for them to be able to ride in the rest of the way to Bethlehem. A man named Simon is, um, is leading the ox team in, uh, in front of the cart. And the angel Gabriel has now taken the form of a rabbi named Gabriel. And he is riding in the cart with them. And we'll pick up there. Aegis hovered in front of the wagon and Paragon behind. Both were alert, wings spread, swords drawn. Up until this stop, I had flown with them, but something seemed suspicious about the wagon, so I took the form of a person. My battalion didn't need me to remind them, but I did anyway. Hell does not want Emmanuel born. Stay alert. Invisible angels a dozen deep encircled the wagon. I smiled to myself. Simon could have driven blindfolded. There was no way this cart would have failed to reach its destination. The congested roads slowed our progress, and so we traveled no faster than those around us on foot. But at least Mary could rest. She closed her eyes, leaned her head against the side of the wagon. 
I could see the radiance in her womb. He glowed like a healing fire. I worshipped him, even unborn. My heart celebrated with silent songs of praise, which he could hear. I smiled as Mary felt him move. Around me, the army heard my song and joined in praise. About an hour later, I sensed it. Evil. My body tensed. The feel of deviltry was on the road, lurking among the travelers. I alerted the angels. Be ready. Sophio entered the cart and whispered, He prowls as a lion, looking for someone to devour. I nodded in agreement and searched the faces of those walking near the wagon. A young man approached the cart. He asked Mary, You look tired. Would you like some water? Mary said, Thank you, and reached for the offered wineskin. I jumped to my feet, purposely bumping the demon's arm, so the water pouch fell to the ground. Mary and Joseph heard me apologize, but only the young man heard me challenge him. Beast of hell, you shall not touch this daughter of God. The demon vacated the body of the man and drew a sword. You have no chance this time, Gabriel, he cried. And suddenly, dozens of demons appeared from all sides and raced toward Mary. Joseph, she spoke, her face full of pain as she held her womb. Something's wrong. It's, it's like something's hitting me in the stomach. I, I'm in terrible pain. Instantly, I assumed my angelic form and wrapped myself around her as a shield. The demon's sores pierced me. I felt their sting, but she was safe. Just then, Paragon and seven angels appeared, slashing at the demons' backs. The demons were distracted, but they were still determined. The wagon began to shake. Travelers began to panic. I heard a cry. I looked up in time to see Simon clutch his throat. His face was red and his eyes bulged. Around his neck, I could see the spiny fingers of a troll. Another demon had bewitched the ox, causing it to lurch spastically toward the side of the road. Someone screamed, Stop the wagon! There's a cliff ahead! A courageous man attempted to grab the reins, but he couldn't move. Simon grasped for breath and slumped sideways on the seat. I knew he was dead. The possessed animal swerved madly toward the cliff. I looked at Mary. Joseph's arm was around her shoulders. Her hand was on her stomach. I knew that in a matter of seconds we would crash over the edge into the valley below. The driver was dead. The wagon was out of control. I turned and called to the only one who could help. From the womb, God spoke. His parents did not hear. The word was not for the ears of Mary and Joseph. Only the hosts of heaven and hell could hear the word. And when they did, they all stopped. Life. The command flooded the wagon as totally as it had flooded Eden. The demons began scattering like rats. Life came the command a second time. Simon coughed as air, air filled his lungs. The reins, I shouted. He grasped, gasped, grabbed the reins and pulled himself erect. Through watery eyes, he saw the edge of the road and instinctively yanked the animal back until it stopped. We were safe. Even with the demons gone, I took no chances. I ca called Samantha, Sophio over. They found her on the road. They will find room at the inn. Do what needs to be done. Sophio saluted and roared ahead to the inn at Bethlehem. Mary remained enveloped in my light. Joseph watched her with alarm until she relaxed in my care. I'm better now, she said. Then she looked around. What happened to the rabbi? Mm -hmm. Longfellow has this moment of despair in that third verse, but how quickly it begins to change. It, when, when we get to the fourth verse of the song, he's already beginning to see something that, that, that stands out to him. He says, Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace, honor, goodwill to men. See, in that account in Revelation, we also hear this. Now comes the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers the, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen. See, when, when, when Satan thought that he had trumped them, he thought that he, oh, I think I got this figured out. And, but Jesus, coming in the flesh, surprised Satan. 
Now, I, in fairness, I quoted a verse earlier, but I only quoted part of it when Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, and, and it is true. But we need to see the full context, the full verse of what Jesus actually said. I have told you all of these things so that in me you may have peace. Mm -hmm. You may have peace on earth. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yes. In this world we'll have trouble. If you are looking to the world for peace and goodwill and joy and happiness, you're not going to find it. Jesus said, in me is where you're going to find the peace. In me is where you're going to find it. But then look at the promise that he gave us as well. He said this. Um, click a couple more verses. We read these already from Revelation. In, in uh, Luke's Gospel, he tells us the authority that he has given us because, because he has overcome. He said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. That's the authority that he's given us because he came and was born as a man, lived in this same flesh that you and I do, and overcame all of the, the, the temptations that the devil threw his way. Never sinned, never messed up. He was victorious, relying on his father. And he says, now, I've given you that same authority that you could be an overcomer. Did you see what he said here in, in, in Revelation? He said that our, our victory comes from two things, from the blood of the lamb, Jesus, the perfect lamb, and the word of our testimony. And I've said this before, you know what, it's important for us to remember. God, his Holy Spirit in us, reads our thoughts, gives us thoughts, helps us to think the right way. Satan can try to implant thoughts. He can try to, to get us to think a certain way, but he can't read our thoughts. And so that's why it's important to, at times when you are being perplexed by the things around you, when you feel like peace and goodwill are, are gone, that, that I'm under attack, that's when you have to say the words out loud. So your own ears sometimes need to hear those words. And if there's, if there's demons around that are perplexing you, they need to hear those words too because he's given you all the authority to trample on them and to be an overcomer. You don't have to live in darkness. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live bombarded by ill will, but you have peace and you have goodwill and you have joy and you have salvation because it's in him. That's what the incarnation signals for us. So, John, so Jesus said in John chapter 14, he said this. He said, I, I want you to, to take heart. Go ahead and click that slide. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Amen. Trust in me. That Jesus coming, being born as he was, was the fulfillment of the promise of God which means we can trust him to fulfill every <coughs> promise that is going to come. John also writes in his, in his first epistle, he, started, he writes about the spiritual warfare that we'll all be in. I want you to hear these words from 1 John chapter 4. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh that there's his incarnation, that first advent, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now in the world. And then listen to what he says, words very similar to what Jesus told us about our ability to overcome. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. He cannot Amen. stop you. He cannot stop you. And so then we get to this last verse in this song, and he talks about this switch. He says, listen, he says, Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. It went from the darkness to the light, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. There are going to be those dark times. 
Longfellow got hey, first two verses. Oh man, this is great. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm living a lie. Maybe hate is stronger than love. Maybe, and then all of a sudden, nope, I'm hearing these promises again. I'm hearing those bells chime. God is not dead. He's not weakened. He's Amen. not going to be defeated. Mm -hmm. He's never been thwarted. He's never had to scramble to come up with plan B. Amen. And then there's that peace that I can cling to. And so I love what Paul tells us, this challenge that he gives us in Romans chapter 12. He says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus has given you that authority to be the overcomer. When you acknowledge Jesus came in the flesh, he is the Lord, he is the Savior, John says the same thing. You have the power, you have the ability then to overcome that. Don't give in, don't be overcome by evil. Don't try to throw in the towel and say, oh man, I don't even know how I'm going to go on. So I want to pray with you today before uh, we, we dismiss and go about our activities Maybe as you look back on this year, you say, you know, this has been kind of a rough year. So kind of almost related more with that verse three of saying, it seems pretty dark. There were times that I was saying, maybe hate can overcome the love. Maybe there is more ill will than goodwill. Maybe there's more turmoil than peace. Friends, I believe that, that the Word of God brings life to our soul mm -hmm. and can lift our gaze. And in this world, if you just stick with that phrase, in this world, you are going to have trouble. But the trouble can't sink you. The trouble can't pull you down because Jesus has given us the authority to overcome and we can overcome that evil with the good that he'll allow us to do. And so I want to pray for you today. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I know some of my friends have had a challenging year. They've gone through some battles. They might even be in the midst of some of those battles right now. And maybe at times it does seem like hate is winning. Seems like the darkness is overcoming the light. But Lord, I pray that by the power of your word, as we just read, we overcome that darkness by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And our testimony is that our Savior came to earth, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he died as my perfect sacrificial lamb, and he rose again. And so I have peace. I have forgiveness. I have joy. I have promises that I can't even count because Jesus paid for all of those. And so, Lord, for my friends that have been going through the battle, would you bring a healing to them? Would you bring a joy to their heart that maybe they haven't known for a while? Would you drive out despair with your peace? May they truly know what it is to have not just peace on earth, but peace in their hearts, peace in their families, peace in the circumstances that they've been going through. Because we don't keep our eyes on this world, but in you is where we have peace. In you is where we overcome. And through you, God, we can overcome the evil around us by the good that you've enabled us to do. And so, Lord, I pray for all of us as we celebrate your first advent, mm -hmm. as we live in you, and as we look forward to your soon coming second advent, when you'll come back to bring those that love you home with you forever. May we be ones that live victoriously, that we are not overcome by evil, but we overcome the evil around us with good because of what you did for us and how you empowered us to live that way. Thank you, Jesus. Bless my friends as they celebrate your birth and they contemplate all the great things that that's brought to their life. In Jesus' name. God bless you, friends. Have a Merry Christmas. I'm so glad that you are, were here.